Separation of duties, also called segregation of duties, is the bedrock of a strong internal control process across the entire accounting, finance, and procure to pay chain. It is especially important when it comes to the accounts payable process, as well as for those who are looking to avoid getting dinged in a Sarbanes-Oxley audit. We're going to go through the various tasks typically handled by an accounts payable department and point out which tasks should not be handled by the same individual. We'll start with a discussion of why this matters so much. Make sure you stick around until the end when we discuss the one all too common practice that completely negates all the hard work done setting up the appropriate separation of duties across the procure to pay or accounts payable function. So I want to start off by talking about the basics of separation of duties or what I call appropriate separation of duties. What this means when we're talking about payments and invoice processing and basically the entire accounts payable function and everything that goes into this whole process. We're talking about making sure that no one individual can handle more than one leg of the procure to pay process starting with the issuing of the purchase order and ending up with the follow-up work that's done after the invoice is paid and the follow-up work and the regulatory reporting. So let's dive in and take a little bit of a, a look. I want to address what I call the looming technology issue here. Typically in the past, and by the past I mean 10 years or more ago, when we talked about separation of duties issues related to the accounts payable function, it was a small company issue. It was not something that mid-sized companies and large companies ever even thought about. However, we've had a lot of technology advances, a lot of technology coming into our accounts payable function. We've got a lot of invoice automation. We've got accounts payable automation solutions that are being used by a growing number of companies. And we're starting to make more and more electronic payments. So less paper checks and less of all the manual work that goes into handling those paper checks, the data entry, et cetera, et cetera. So what this means is we have smaller and smaller accounts payable departments. And this means that what was once just a small company issue is now an issue that is being faced by a growing number of companies. So appropriate separation of duties uh, is becoming something that more companies have to address. Sometimes people will say, I don't understand. What's the big deal? Why is separation of duties so important? From a basic standpoint, it provides a system of checks and balances kind of just like our government. So no one person has too much power. It makes fraud more difficult. Now you notice I didn't say it makes fraud impossible because um, sadly um, it doesn't make it impossible. It's just one tool in your arsenal to pr protect against fraud. But what it does mean is that in order for certain frauds to occur, there needs to be collusion. And if you have separation of appropriate separation of duties, if you don't, and you have one person doing one or two tasks, uh, then that collusion is not necessary and the fraud becomes a little easier to perpetrate. And I'm going to give you some examples as we go through the nuts and bolts of the separation of duties. I want to start off because this is sometimes where we see most of the problems with talking about your invoice processes, the people who get your invoices and process them. Um, those people should not process purchase orders. They should not create purchase orders. They should not fix purchase orders. They should just take the purchase order as issued and use it. And if there's anything that needs to be changed, they need to go back to purchasing. They should not have anything to do either with issuing payments. This means generating them, signing checks, etc. They should also not enter information in the master vendor file and what should they update it? And this is one of the areas where we see a lot of separation of duties falls down. This is one of the big areas where it falls down. And finally, they should not have anything to do with your receiving practice, okay? All they should be handling is the invoices and the processing of invoices. And you know, they do the three-way match, etc. If you want more information about the three-way match, we have more videos on it and you can look at this chat, this channel after you finish this one to Get updated. So that's the, the invoice process. And now let's turn our attention to the person who checks, who signs checks. And when I say, I say sign checks because, you know, that's the world that we've lived in for the most of um, our business lives. But at the same time as we're talking about check signers, we're also talking about people who can approve ACH payments that have been set up. So usually uh, when you issue an ACH, it's a two-step process. Someone sets it up, another person releases it or approves it. 
And so um, that's the people that we're talking about. So those people should not be or able to authorize a payment. So they shouldn't say, hey, yes, sign this, this item needs to be paid and then go ahead and pay it, pay it. nor should they have access to the check stock if you're using paper checks, pre-printed paper checks, or perhaps you're using safety paper, but you don't want that person to have access to the, to the check stock. And not surprisingly, the next person I'm going to talk about is the person who is responsible for the check stock. And if you have pre-printed check stock, which about 20 to 25% of the companies out there still do, it should be kept under lock and key. Um, and the person who has, the, who has control of that, uh, that key should not obviously be a, an authorized signer nor, by the way, should they be doing your bank reconciliations, because if they are doing the bank reconciliations, then there's all sorts of other games that they can play. So going back to the check signer, the person responsible for the check stock, if somebody is an authorized signer and they have access to the check stock, they can write checks to their heart's content. And while you may consider those checks fraud, the bank will honor them because they had every right to, to write those checks, at least as far as the bank's concerned, obviously not as far as okay. you are. Now, let's talk about the person who does your bank statements reconciliation, okay? Now, we don't often think about this person uh, when it comes to separation of duties, but I want you to think about them. This person should not do your unclaimed property reporting because if the person who does the uh, bank statement also does the unclaimed property reporting, there are games that they can play. And actually, real world, I've had several examples of it. They should also not be a signer on your bank accounts. It's just too many areas where something can go wrong. Before we turn our attention to master vendor file, I'd like to request that if you're getting any value of, out of this, you hit that thumbs up button to let both YouTube and myself know that this information is useful to you and should be shared with more people. And for me, that I should make more like it. And if you have done that, I would like to just take this moment to say uh, thank you. It is appreciated. Okay, as I said, person who handles the master vendor file. The person who handles your master vendor file should do master vendor file and nothing else having to do with invoice processing or making payments. So this means they should not be an authorized signer nor should they be an approver. They should not be able to approve invoices for payments. They should not be able to approve ACH payments. And they should also not be doing your unclaimed property report. Uh, now, I've mentioned unclaimed property reporting several times. The person who is doing that, unsurprisingly, should not have responsibility for bank reconciliations and access to the master vendor file. We've talked a lot about the right way and the wrong way to do things, and you can see how these all kind of interact, if you will, interlude with each other. I want to also talk about one big separation of duties flaw that, that we see many times, and this will be in, a, in an organization who has everything set up perfectly, and I mean perfectly, and they'll show me their separation of duties, and it's exactly like I've been talking today, even possibly sometimes better. And then they'll say, oh, but Joe or Jane has access to everything. And I'm like, what? Uh, Joe or Jane will end up usually being the controller, um, maybe um, an accounts payable manager, the director of accounts payable, or some high, other high-level executive. And I'll say, okay, that's, that's nice. Why do they have access to everything? And the answer usually is something along the lines of so they can jump in at the end of the month or the end of the quarter or the end of the fiscal year end if we have a backlog or, and they can help and they can get us to the you know month end quarter end close faster also so that they can do some training. And while those are decent answers, they're not great answers because the need for appropriate controls should, actually trumps that. Sadly, this isn't the only problem that organizations are likely to run into when it comes to separation of duties. There are other issues that everyone needs to be aware of. That's why we did a separate talk on this issue, which you can watch right now using the link that has appeared on your YouTube screen and is in the description.